So it's August 26th, just after one o'clock in the afternoon, and I'm sitting with Brenda Langman. Yes. Um, okay, so to maybe just get started, could you talk a little, I know you have numerous positions while you were here, but uh, maybe talk a little bit about what you did at the bunker and um, what your responsibilities were. Well, I came here straight out of recruit training. So I did my basic training in Nova Scotia, was posted to Kingston and did my trade training, which was communications, obviously. And um, this was my first posting. In When you go through Kingston, where you learn your trade, they always ask you toward the end of your course, where would you like to be posted? And they always say you have three options, you know, three choices. Hopefully you'll get one, hopefully you won't, or maybe you won't. Everybody wanted to go home, all the French people wanted to go home, all the people from down east wanted to go back east somewhere and be closer to their parents and their families and friends. But um, I just wanted adventure, so I put anywhere, anywhere, anywhere as my three choices, and I got here. <laughs> and everyone's going, oh, it's a bomb shelter, and the NCOs at the time, when they found out that one other girl and I both got CARP, we didn't know what CARP was. We had no idea. And all the NCOs are going, oh, you know, they just thought that was pretty hilarious because CARP was an underground, this, you know, creepy bunker and nobody knew what was going on down here or anything. So we're like, OK, what did we get ourselves into? So we're on the bus and we're busing out from Kingston and we were on some kind of a, a multi-passenger van at one point, And that ended up being the CARP shuttle that would take us back and forth to work every day. But um, we're driving and driving and driving. And of course, I'm from the Vancouver area, so I'm not used to wide open spaces like this. And I'm thinking, OK, why the heck is he taking us? So we're going along, going along. And finally, he says, OK, we're here. And we see the big, huge green and white sign that says Canadian Forces Station Carp. And it's like, where? There's no buildings. Like, And then we saw the little guard shack. And it's like, we work in there? Like, we didn't get it. Nobody had told us yet that it was a bunker. They just, they knew. And they were going, ha ha, you're going to enjoy that. But no one had actually told us that we were going to be underground. And so finally, we got out. And we had to sign in at the front gate and everything. And we had our suitcases and stuff because, you know, we didn't have anywhere to stay. We were going to be sleeping down here for indefinitely. So we came in. We didn't have enough of a security clearance to work anywhere else except the switchboard. So we were sleeping in the women's quarters. And our first job was the switchboard. And as you've seen in the photos back then, it was the old plug and cord board. And it was this massive big thing, probably almost the length of this whole room. And we walked in and there was one guy sitting on a bar stool type thing and he was going like, you know, hello, Canadian Forces Station Carp. And he's and it's we were just so overwhelmed. First of all, who in our generation has ever seen one of these that is still active? And who's ever worked on one at our age? You know, I was your age. How old are you? Five. Yeah, okay. Well, I left here when I was your age, but I was I was 18, 19 years old when I came in, and it's my mom never even worked on one of these. You know, my God, what am I doing here? So that was my first job, and um, that was pretty scary. So we had a training headset on where we were sort of listening in on the phone calls of the person that knew how to use this big, huge board, and it was pretty scary. I didn't want to answer the board. It's like, oh, my God, what I, don't, I won't know what to say, and, I, God, there's so many holes. How do you know what's what? And But it was pretty easy to learn. Everything was numbered, and, but the numbers were really tiny, and the back cord was to take an incoming call, and then the front cord, because they were in rows of two all the way along. So you answered it using the back cord and you took the front cord out and put it into the local where they wanted. So if, if somebody called in wanting Warren Officer Smith, Warren Officer Smith is with us, by the way, <laughs> Joe Smith, I would answer the outside incoming call and I would find his local. And if you tapped the end of the um, plug to this little hole, which is Warren Officer Smith's local, if it crackled in my headset, I knew that he was on the phone. And if I plugged in, I could just listen to him talking, but he would hear me. So um, you just kind of tap it. If you can hear a crackle, I'm sorry, he, can you call back? We didn't really have hold buttons, I don't think, back then. But um, so that was pretty cool. And it was really, and you'd get other people coming in. They would just be there. They would be privates awaiting training, and they would come in. And, of course, they didn't have enough of a security clearance to work anywhere else. So they were always, we called them PATS, privates awaiting training. And they'd walk into this big, huge monster octopus switchboard and they'd be looking, oh, and you could see the horror in their eyes. Oh, my God. But it was great, you know, because I thought, huh, I know what I'm doing. You know, <laughs> like, it's easy. Oh, it's easy. So that was my first job. Um, 
Oh, I'm sorry, am I? Okay, okay. Um, my next job, when I finally got a bit more of a security clearance and a little bit more um, experience, they moved me into FCC, which was just two doors down. But again, it was a very restricted area. I wasn't allowed in. It was like all the older people and the more mature people were able to go there, but I was never allowed. And finally, I was allowed into the FCC. So I learned how to be part of the control center. And that was pretty cool because you would be talking on a teletype machine, an old Model 28. And at a certain time of the day, which is midnight, Greenwich Mean Time, everything had to be reset and it, all the counters went back to number one or back to zero. And you had to send um, um, a typed message. And this is long before email and live chatting or any of that was even dreamed of. We just didn't have it back then. I know you can't imagine that, but we just didn't have it. So to be typing live on this clunky old big huge monster typewriter that's got like paper feeding out of it to type, you know, welcome to, you know, Thursday mate, how are you? And at the other end of it was a guy in England standing there doing the same thing, you know, talking to you. And it's like, this is incredible. Like it was incredible technology for the time. It was really exciting. And then if we happened to be on midnights for um, like a special occasion, like Christmas or something, we would send a whole row of like uppercase eight, you know, like the big stars and everything and make it look really fancy. And it was just really neat. But everything reset at midnight Greenwich Mean Time, which I'm not sure, I think it was five hours early or something for us. And we called that HJ or dailies and everything changed. You had to reset all your cryptos and everything. It was very, very cool. Very neat. Nothing else in the world like it. And nothing compares today to it. It's just really cool stuff. So I worked there for a year and then I got more of a security clearance and was able to go into the message center, which is where my trade was intended to work. So I got to go in there and actually go back to my old training from Kingston when I was 18 and sort of start working on that equipment again. And I could barely remember because it had been two years almost at that point. So, um, but that was pretty cool because you were on your own in that room. In FCC, you know, you had a team of people working there. So, and I was always the youngest to the lowest rank and all that. But in the Comsen, it was just me, you know, and there would be the shift supervisor would come around and kind of ring the doorbell and come in and, you know, thumb through the, the message traffic and see what's going on and just make sure I'm still alive and all that. It was just really neat. It was so, so cool. And back then too, we had the old, um, and again, I'd never seen any of this and never thought I would ever see this in my lifetime, or even my mom's lifetime. But um, in the back corner was these two big um, stands, these metal stands. They were floor to ceiling racks. And they had these clacking, clack, 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 little machines that were spitting out ticker tape. And I'd never seen anything like that in my whole life either. I mean, that was really old technology, clack, 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 clack. And there's this tape shooting out and it's piling up on the ground. And you've got to stand in there with your, you know, your military boots on and try not to tear any of it. Because if you are, you're tearing a message in half and God help you because you can't splice it back together. So it was really, it was very exciting. And so it was just so unique. And even at 18, 19, 20 years old, I recognized the uniqueness of this place and I loved it, you know, and I'm not saying that I, it was always 100% fun. I mean, I had some personality clashes with some of my colleagues and some of the younger people in here too, you know, we were kind of jealous of each other and stealing each other's boyfriends and things. But I always knew I'll never come back. I can't believe I'm here to begin with. It's so awesome. It's such a unique place. So I always was in awe of the place. And just the opportunities that I, I had here, I knew I would never, ever get anywhere else because this place was so behind the times. It was, I mean, a plug and cord switchboard and this clack, 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 clack ticker tape. And there's a way to wrap ticker tape and it's around your um, finger and thumb, your, your baby pinky and your thumb, and it's a figure eight. And boy, when you're first trying to learn how to do that, to take this big, huge pile of ticker tape up to your knees and... Um, make it into something that is readable and usable, you would have to wrap it and then feed it through a tape reader. And that would bring it up onto a screen, which again, we thought was quite modern. Nowadays, it's like, <sighs> but, um, and sometimes it would be garbled. And that was my job to go through and read all the stuff and make sure that it was usable because if it's all like garbage and stuff, then it wasn't usable. And I'd have to send a, a request for a correction over to the sending, the sending base, wherever in the country it was, or 
England. Sometimes they came from England. And um, it was just really, it was fascinating, wonderful, cool, old, 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 old stuff that I knew I'd never see it again. And that's what made it really special. And then um, in the back room, we had these old crypto machines that um, I had learned on my TQ3, or on my trade training in Kingston. But they had told us that they were on their way out and, you know, and you probably won't see them much, but we still have to teach them because some places have them. And sure enough, we had them and it's like, they're going to have them here. I just know it. <laughs> and sure enough, they had them and they were still quite modern compared to some of the other crypto machines that we were using in other places. It's like, oh my God, what's that? So um, it was just exciting, very exciting. And that was my, um, my responsibility as well as we had a certain time of day that we had to reset our crypto machines so that, and at the very same time, wherever they lived in the world, the other end of that circuit was also resetting so that our keys, our crypto keys always matched. Because if one number was wrong on either end, nothing would work. So it was very detailed, painstaking to set the crypto key. I know it doesn't make sense. I just don't want to get too technical because I'm afraid I'll say too much. But, but anyways, it was just an old, um, it was just this funny board and it had a whole bunch of numbers and sliding things. And you had to slide all these little pins up to a certain number. And it changed every 24 hours at the exact same time. Our end of the circuit had to reset. And the other end, whether that was in the States or in Europe somewhere, they had to change. And it was always a different time of the day. So you're not resetting 15 circuits at once. But so it was just really exciting. And then I got more of a security clearance and was able to go down to OSACS. And the OSACS is the epitome of the, you know, this is what the whole, the whole station is sort of revolves around OSACS. And yet nobody's allowed in there. So it was really exciting to finally be able to see past that door. So, um, and they had uh, a crypto room. Everybody running out of tape? No. no. They had a crypto room that was even beyond the crypto room that I had been using in the message center. And they had stuff that was completely from the 18th century, I'm sure. I'm sure. And I'm sure if I, I, I wish I had gone to the Kingston Museum, because if that stuff is sitting on display in the Kingston Museum, I could describe it better, but I can't because I don't know what's common knowledge yet and what's not. But um, it was just a lot harder to set than the boards that I had used in the message center with, you know, the sliding pegs up to the numbers. This was much more difficult. And I was really good at it. And to this day, I'm very good at word find puzzles and anything that's, you know, picking, as we used to say, the fly shit out of the pepper. Pardon me, kids. But I'm very good at I'm very good at picking the detail out. And that's because of this crypto setting, all these crypto boards and having to get every single wire perfect and I mean, if it wasn't perfect, it didn't work, you know, and so it was just really a cool, cool way to start. So um, after OSACS, I ended up going to days for my last year here. And I was chosen as the training uh, NCO clerk. So they called it the STNCO, the training slant STNCO. So I was helping the training NCO and I was also taking all the stats of, you know, all the traffic that we had sent, message traffic I'm talking about, and just other things, training stats and all these other stats. I was just the stats collector for the building and made sure everybody had their, you know, all the courses that they were due for. So that was very different because I had never been a day worker ever, not even, you know, I was always a shift worker. So that was pretty cool to, to see the whole base or the whole bunker that was always full of people. I could actually go for coffee when everybody else went for coffee because as the skeleton crew, the shift worker, all the day people would go for coffee and we would be the ones stuck behind. And then when they came back from their coffee, then we could go. So it was always us. We were always with our shift, which made us close, but we never really got to know the, the day baggers <laughs> very well. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so we we just we always kind of hated them because they were privileged and they got to go to all the you know all the stuff the Friday afternoon this and that over at the mess and we could never leave you know we were the skeleton crew so the day staff always got to go to the mess for you know TGIF on Friday and stuff and anything that was kind of fun that the base was doing or the station was doing all the day people could be excused but we couldn't there always had to be that skeleton crew in the message center, in the switchboard and in the comm center, or sorry, the OSACs. And so there was always, the shift workers were always kind of left out. And, you know, so I think there was sometimes a little bit of resentment that the day staff got so many, so many more fun hours in their day than we did, you know. But so for my last job here, 
um, I was a day day worker, and it was a very different experience. It was a lot, just a lot less pressure of always making sure. I mean, the the shift workers are the backbone of the whole place. You know, without the people and all these secret areas, you know, the place doesn't really run that well. Other than you know having the lights on and stuff, but that's the whole reason for being is for is OSACs, right? So, so anyways, it was it was pretty cool. Okay, next question. Okay. God, what was the question again? <laughs> Um, you mentioned just at the end there a uh, bit of the social activities that would go on in the yeah. bunker. Were those pretty frequent and like what kinds of things went on? In my experience, we didn't have a whole lot down here. We would have Christmas mess dinner and Christmas men's mess dinner is the one time of year that um, the kitchen staff and the lower ranks, the junior ranks, got to sit down and be waited on by the senior ranks and the officers. And being just a small station, we didn't have a lot of officers. I think we had three or four, three or four. So the higher ranks, like Warren Officer Smith here, would, would be one of the ones serving as well, because they just, how do you serve 200 people with you know four guys? <laughs> so, so all the senior ranks got involved, and usually it's just the officers. But So we finally got to be the ones sitting down, and they were the ones serving us. So that was very exciting. But it was um, a mess dinner. I don't know how much you know about mess dinners, but they're very formal. The, um, the dining room would be set up in the shape of an E, with a long head table as the back of the E and then very long extensions down. And we'd all be dressed to the nines with our, you know, our mess kit and whatever we had. I think, I don't think many of us had mess kit at that rank, but we'd be sitting there and it was all kind of, you know, we're at a mess dinner. So everyone's behaving in the beginning and then they're pouring the wine into us. And this is back before the days of everyone being paranoid about you know, drinking and driving. We weren't as paranoid about that back then. And the beauty of being here and having a beer at the, you know, a beer at the mess or whatever is there was a million beds in here. So if someone was too drunk to drive into bed, they just spend the night, you know, it wasn't a big deal. So we could get schnockered and we just spent the night or that they, they would have a shuttle on to take us back to the barracks if anyone wanted to do that. But if you wanted to stay longer and close the mess down, you just crawl home and pick a bed. And yeah, it was just, it was awesome. This was a great place. So um, the mess dinners always became a bit of a, not a riot. I don't want to say riot because I'm from Vancouver, but, <laughs> but they got very rowdy toward the end because we're all drinking. It's Christmas. We're all friends for the most part. Right. And it was just a lot of fun, a lot of fun. So many, so many good memories. We had a winter carnival every um, February, and I've actually got books from that with me in my purse, wherever my purse is. I've got um, three years worth of them. That was a lot of fun. I have a video, and I tried to copy it because it was on VHS. So the 1989 winter carnival, somebody videotaped it, but the cameras back then were these big, huge Hollywood types with a big shoulder, but they recorded onto VHS. I do have a little machine that will transfer it over to... to something that you can put on your computer, but it's so big, the file, it was like a two and a half hour video. So the file is so big, I couldn't put it onto a DVD. So it's like, oh, and I don't know how to split it so that it's on two DVDs. So if I ever figure that out, I'll mail it to you. But um, you're just going to see a bunch of really, you know, uh, really crazy, crazy things. Some of the, I don't know, whoever invented the Winter Carnival um, um, competitions, but they were just crazy. They're, it's the kind of thing where all the skill in the world is not going to help you. You know, it's made for people so that we're all on a level playing field and nobody, none of these sports guys are going to be, you know, really, really good at anything. We had um, blow ball. Have you ever heard of blow ball? It's a pool table with a ping pong ball and everybody's kneeling all around it. And it's, um, we were all divided into four teams and it was, you know, it would be like a round robin situation where two teams would play together. The winner would play the winner of those two teams. And then finally the, the final two teams would square off. But I mean, it was just, it was impossible to be good at it. You know, you had your hands behind your back. You weren't allowed to be up past your, your, like your clavicles here, your shoulder blades. Um, sorry. And uh, you had to blow this ball and into one of the end um, pockets of this pool table it was crazy, crazy, crazy fun. Everybody's laughing and they're dizzy from blowing so hard and they're blowing in each other's face. And it was just so funny to see everybody kind of doing the neck fighting thing. And, oh, it was funny. And then we had um, the, the usual staples like, you know, tug of war and stuff. That was, but then we would have um, 
Oh God, I just watched the tape. It was so funny. Oh, just the balloon shaving where you've got the person underneath and you've got the, you've got to shave a balloon filled with water. And of course it inevitably explodes all over them and bobbing for apples. But it was really, I can't remember what the situation was, but it was not, it was not easy by any stretch that they, they had some gimmick in there where it was really hard. And, um, the golf thing was, uh, you would have a pool cue and an egg and you'd have to, <laughs> this impossible golf course outside in the snow and you would, and then one of them was um, a ping pong ball with a hammer and that was how you had to get that around and oh it's just really silly stuff impossible to do it impossible to do it good and blind volleyball where instead of a net it was a big huge thing so everyone's there and you know it, all of a sudden the ball comes over it's like ah! it was just impossible to be good it was just so much fun we we laughed so hard and it was just one of those things you won by fluke because there was no skill involved. It was just fun. And your face hurt from laughing. And it was actually a work day. So we had Friday and Saturday, a two day, a two day carnival. And Friday was actually a designated carnival day, except for the shift workers. But you were allowed to go over. And if the shift workers were on their day off, of course, they were invited. But if you were on duty, you were on duty. The, you know, life still had to go on down here. But um, everybody else, the day workers, were allowed to go over and spend the day. That was our work day that day, was to just go over and support this carnival. And the, all the associate members of the mess, which were people that lived locally, they were invited. And it was just so much fun. And then the Saturday was the last day. And we had a king and queen crowning and skits and, and beer. You know, it was just a lot of fun. A lot of, just so much fun. My God, so much fun. And we would have mug outs when somebody would leave. You never just got, you know, okay, bye, nice working with you, ever, ever. It was always a big send off in the mess. And they gave you your plaque and um, you had to have a beer and you had to chug a lug of beer and then put the, turn it up over your heads. And, you know, it had to be empty or you'd have a head full of beer. And, oh, it was just so much fun. So much fun. What else did we do? Oktoberfest. Oktoberfests. We had Oktoberfest at the mess. We had bingo at the mess. We had... 50s parties and yeah. oh god just Halloween. Halloween parties it it was just the thing is I guess with working underground and this is how it was very first explained to me when I first cleared in and clearing in means going from section to section with a little card and if you needed something from that section like a pillow for your bedroom or something you would sign for it and then when you left you had to clear out so you would, they would go and they would have a record. You borrowed a pillow and two blankets. You have to send that, you have to give that back or we're not going to sign your clearance card. So you could only leave when everything was signed off. And that way they knew you had given everything back that you had borrowed over the years. But when they, when I very first signed into the, um, the police section, the military police, they told me that, because I think I had made mention of all the stripes on the walls and the different color tiles, and it was kind of bright and cheery down here. And they explained to me that that was for a reason, that like all the different colored chairs, all the plastic chairs down in the, um, in the cafeteria, they're all like orange and yellow and very, very bright and very cheery. And when you work underground, even for people who aren't claustrophobic, if everything was sort of gray and icky and, and mono, monotone color, it would be very depressing, even in, a, in an above ground building, but just knowing that you're under the dirt as well as, you know, you're not just in a building with no windows. Because in our trades, we never had windows because everything was top secret. You never had a window. But, um, but just knowing that you're coming in on the top floor and you're going down to go to work, that was really scary for some people and, and depressing. And a lot of people just didn't want to be here. And, you know, I mean, the air, one thing that Joe and I noticed is that the air in here is really kind of dank and icky and a little bit humid it was never like that when we were here it was a normal working environment and uh, all the pictures that were on the wall all the murals that you saw all of our tin furniture and that was something else that they explained to me is the furniture was all tin because if there was ever a fire they couldn't have much that was flammable so it was all tin and non-flammable and um even the drawers, I don't know if you've noticed, but the drawers in the bedrooms and stuff, they're all multicolored and stuff. Like the, maybe the um, the little dresser itself might be gray, a light colored gray, but the drawers are yellow and orange and stuff. And that was just for morale. And it worked because for the most part, we were pretty happy down here. Pretty happy campers. I mean, not everybody loved this place as much as I did, I don't think. But, you know, 
I loved it. You know, I had personality clashes with people just like I would anywhere else, you know, and we didn't all get along like, you know, best buddies, but it was a fantastic place to work. I never had a bad boss. I, in fact, I invited Joe to come here because I wanted to see him so bad. You know, he's one of my good, my, one of my good memories of the place. I've got several of my supervisors here that I wish I could see, I, I could see again, but yeah, Joe was certainly one of them. So yeah, so it was just, uh, it was really good. And there was always something going on at the mess, always something. And all the people that live locally were always involved, you know, just, I don't know, it was just a really neat place, you know, it was a really cool place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, you were mentioning that they painted things, um, morale. Mm -hmm. Was there ever any, like, did you ever get any comments from people that you knew or hear about people saying that there were like psychological issues? Yeah, well, I'll tell you a little story. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if, I don't know if you heard about this, Joe, because I wasn't working for you at this point, but when I was in the switchboard, I was brand new and I had, <laughs> I had a little plastic thing, a dog poo. And it was just something I thought, I'm very immature at heart. I thought this was so funny. And one of these privates awaiting training, these Pat guys, who was here for just, you know, a short time, he was just here for the summer waiting for his course to start in Kingston. He was, he had relieved me. I was working the evening shift. So I started, I think at four and I was off at 11 or whatever it was. And um, I had gone down into the bed, or I know what I had done. I had gone down on my lunch hour or my supper hour, I guess you'd call it. And I had gotten this fake dog poop. And in the switchboard room, which you guys have labeled as the message center, but it's not, it's the old switchboard. The message center is in the far corner where that gallery thing is. That's the real message center. This, the place where you guys have it was the switchboard. But um, there's a little bathroom in there, just a little sort of a sink and a toilet and that's it. And it was just because the switchboard operator was pretty much stuck there all day and thus they got relieved. And so they could quickly take a, a leak if they needed to. So, um, I thought it would be funny to um, set this guy up. I think his name was Michel, a French guy. And I put this plastic dog poop on the toy on the floor beside the toilet with wet toilet paper on it. And I put an out of order sign on the toilet. <laughs> and I just thought, okay, I'm just going to, you know, he's going to come in at 11 o'clock and, and take over and I'm just going to go home. And the light was off in the bathroom. So I'll go downstairs and go to sleep and, Never thought anything of it. In the back of my mind, I'm thinking, he, 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 not knowing when he would see it, right? Well, apparently he did go to the bathroom once through the night, but it was on his lunch break at, you know, three o'clock in the morning and he was downstairs playing pool and he used the men's room down there. He never did go into the switchboard bathroom. So I came up at nine o'clock the next morning when I was uh, awake and I just wanted to hear from the guy who had relieved Michelle how the joke went over and to get my poop back. Well, I walked in and the SWO was in there. Doug Hildebrand was in there. The Sergeant MP was in there. A um, whole bunch of people in, were in there and Michelle was still awake. He should have been in bed. He would have been, would have been off at six or seven o'clock in the morning. He was still up and he was looking very scared. And um, I walked in and it's like, hi. And it's like, oh my God. And there was yellow police tape across the door. And I'm looking and I'm thinking, okay, what the heck? And poor Michelle is, he was just white. He was so scared. I mean, we, we didn't have any rank. We were so new. We didn't even have any rank at this point. And this poor guy hadn't even, he was just out of basic training. He hadn't even done his trade training yet. So anybody with any, even one Chevron was God, right? So here's this sergeant and the master warrant officer who was the disciplinarian for here. We were terrified of him. And I knew that the sergeant was the MP sergeant because he was the one who cleared me in when I first arrived. And I'm thinking, why are the, po and I saw the tape and the bathroom light was on and it's like, the poop is still there. And it's like, what the hell? So anyways, Michelle is, and they sent me away, private Langman. And it's like, sir, what's going on, please. And, it, and I, I can't remember how it came up, but I was absolutely terrified because you weren't really supposed to talk to these ranking guys unless they talked to you first. At least back then I was so young. I didn't, I didn't have any guts back then. I was very, very young. And anyways, it finally came out that it was fake and it was mine and it was a joke on him. And that, I, you know, oh my God, what had happened was um, he never did use that washroom. He went pee downstairs midway through his shift and that was the, he never opened the door. And when the cleaner came in <laughs> at five o'clock in the morning to do his, you know, cleaning of all the toilets and everything, 
He saw it and refused to clean it up. He went out and told the MP. The MP called the SWO, and this is 5.30 in the morning, whatever time it was. The SWO, the station warrant officer, who was our big disciplinarian and a really tough old guy, probably my age, <laughs> my age now, but he was old back then. So um, he was called in, and everyone lived in Ottawa, so they were being called by the MPs at you know 5.30 in the morning about somebody pooped on the floor in the switchboard. And they, they must have been this Michelle guy, but he was not going to own up to it. And he, oh, he, they were so angry and so upset, and they were going to charge this poor guy. So the SWO said, we have an incident. He called the commanding officer, Major Erickson, said, we have an incident. Everybody came in, and I was still sleeping. I didn't know any of this was going on. So even though their work day didn't start until 8 o'clock, they were all there by 7 and very upset. And this poor guy was being interrogated and... He would not admit to anything. He had no idea, right? So by the time I got there, of course, they were so angry at him because he wasn't fessing up and, you know, trying to teach him about being a soldier and being a man and this is the way it is and blah, blah, blah. And so anyways, I got raked over the coals and I got marched into the station warrant officer's office. And the SWO, like I said, he was very imposing. He was um, not especially tall. Doug Hildebrandt, he was probably 5'10" white hair, dark tanned face, and um, just a really, he looked like a bulldog. Like he always looked mad, but that was his job was to scare the hell out of us because that was his job. He was the, the disciplinarian for the station. So I'm standing outside his office and um, waiting and I'm standing at attention and he calls me in and he's got this roar and I'm bawling, trying, trying hard not to cry really like, <laughs> Because I thought, oh, God, I don't want to look like a stupid idiot on top of being this troublemaker. So I'm standing in his office, and I am shaking, and he is tearing a strip off me. Do you know how much trouble you caused? And that's how I found out that he got a phone call, you know, 530 in the morning, and he had to call, you know, we had this big incident, and he had to call in the, um, the commanding officer, and you got everybody up, and blah, 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 and everybody had to come to work early because of you, and, and then... I, he, I can't remember, I was just basically apologizing and crying and trying not to cry, and I've got all these tears coming down. And he finally dismissed me, and I marched out of his office, and he called me back in, Langman! And I said, yes, sir. And he says, that was a hell of a joke, by the way. And he's got this big laugh and everything, and it's like, okay, thank you, sir. And I walked away, and I'm still bawling, but it's like, he's not going to charge me. It was funny. Anyways, the police confiscated my dog poop. And they gave it back to me when I was mugged out six years later. <laughs> it was presented to me with my plaque. I was not allowed to have it. They kept it locked up in their safe. They had a, a little safe. And I finally got my dog poop back six years later. So anyways, that was, that was my... And the reason why this was such an incident, to answer your question, this is all building up to answer your question, was way back probably in the 60s or 70s, apparently there was somebody that wanted out of here so badly that um, to make his point, he actually pooped in the hall once. He pooped in the hall on, a, on in one of the back hallways or something. He pooped in the hall, and uh, I have no idea who it was. He just wanted out of here really bad. They weren't going to let him go, so he took matters into his own hands, so to speak, and he pooped in the hall. And that's, I guess, Ivan, the cleaner, had been there back then. And when he came in and saw poop on the floor, he said, here we go again. And, you know, and it's like, who knew? There's poor Brenda sawing logs down in the ladies' quarters, not knowing this, this hornet's nest that she had created. So that was the only instance that I know of of somebody that was just so unhappy down here that they want they would do anything to get out. Yeah. We were prepared for it, though. During the BDF scenarios that we had, we would be locked down here for three days, two nights, three days, two nights. Yeah, one time, once a year was seven days, I think. Yeah. So we had scenarios. And again, I wasn't involved because I was always a shift worker. So I was always in the back room, never knew what anyone else was doing. They were having all these cool casualty simulations and stuff where they would like pretend to cut off someone's arm. And oh, it was incredible. They had mock riots at the gate of people trying to get in. And they had a helicopter land and everything. And all this was going on and none of the shift workers knew about it because we were just not involved. Our job was strictly to continue doing what we always did, but it was a 12-hour shift instead of an 8-hour shift. So, yeah, and then we got off shift and we slept and we went back on shift. And so all the day staff were having all these fantastic scenarios all over the place. We had no idea, but 
one of the, the scenarios that we had, and I only found this out on my very last year because I was the day worker in the training section, was, um, and apparently they did it every year, they would always practice for somebody going nuts and um, taking a hostage or something and locking themselves into one of the bedrooms. And it was practicing the MPs and their hostage negotiation skills, which, I mean, let's face it, military police here in Canada don't have to deal with that kind of stuff very often. It's not like civilian police, which Joe and I both work for now, by the way, or you're retired, I'm still in. But um, it's not like regular police where you deal with these incredible in, you know, situations every week. The military police, I mean, everybody's pretty, you know, they were pretty well behaved in the military as people go, I would say, you know, you just have to pull rank on somebody and the argument's over. And if it's not, then, you know, that guy's in a lot of trouble. It's not like in the civilian world where you can say, I'm a cop and you have to do what I say. And they're going to say, you know, you know, like, it's just, it's different. You've got the rank to back you up and the whole court martial process and summary trials and all that. So I, I would suggest, I don't know because I wasn't an MP, a police officer, but their job was not that difficult compared to a real police officer in the civilian world. So this would have really been good practice for them, you know, to actually have somebody who's going bonkers and is not listening to them because they're a sergeant and he, you know, the, the bonkers guy is only a corporal and you can't just stamp your foot and raise your voice and say, you sit down and I mean it right now. You can't do that, right? The guy's nuts. So... My um, friend in the bunker here was one of the guys that um, actually had gotten a hold of a rifle in the scenario and had grabbed one of the cooks and pulled her into one of the bedrooms on the 200 level and had barricaded themselves in. And um, the, the police officers had to talk him out. And it took hours and hours and hours and hours to get that guy, probably six hours they tried to get him out of there and he just wasn't coming. And I mean, I think... I don't know if a real crazy guy would have been easier to talk down off the ledge, but but yeah, Scott just kept them going and kept them going. He was not cooperating. And, you know, like I said, you know, it's not like in the real police world where you can just pull rank on them and, you know, it doesn't work like that in the military. And when it, with a crazy guy who's not, doesn't give a damn what your rank is, it's going to be a lot more difficult. So yeah, it was really good practice for the police. They also had scenarios outside, like I mentioned, where uh, we would have all the gates would be completely closed off because we didn't want the press coming and we didn't want all the civilians in the town of Carp rushing to the bunker because they wanted to be saved from the big nuclear blast. So we would have these mock riots of people trying to throw their children over the fence and all that kind of stuff to try and get their children saved and things that might happen in a real situation. I mean, they had to think of all these things. And um, the press, you know, trying to bang down the gate, trying to get in and stuff and stealing cars and all these. So the police really got to work out during these things. And the medics really got to work out during these, these base defense force practices that we did. And um, we did, somebody came in and did the casualty simulation that I was taught, that I mentioned, where they pretended that the guy had like a massive compound fracture and there was actually like a bone sticking out with blood and it was really very, very graphic. And it was incredible what the day people were doing behind our back as our sh you know, shift workers had no idea this was all going on. Very exciting, very exciting. But that was one of the things that they, they always had to prepare for was some staff member going bonkers and just having enough and that's it, I'm going crazy. And, uh, but I don't think, to my knowledge, it never really happened. Nobody ever got out of control, to my knowledge. Mm -hmm. No, so. What about the case, I mean, for the purpose of the bunker was built in a nuclear attack? Did you guys ever talk about that or was that ever a possibility in your mind? You know, back then it still was. Um, it didn't really, it wasn't a day-to-day -day concern. Um, my whole generation grew up knowing that somebody could press a button and we'd all die. So it was kind of always in the back of our minds that, you know, we're here. But I think the funny thing is about um, the bunker and correct me if I'm wrong, Joe, but if there had really been a nuclear attack, I wouldn't have been invited into this bunker as an employee. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have stayed. It would have been the government that came in. So all these bedrooms and stuff weren't for the military. It was for the government. So we would have been out and they would have been in, I think. They would stay? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
even in a nuclear attack though? Okay, so I guess, but it was always in the back of our mind, but it was certainly not foremost in our mind, not at all. It was just day-to-day -day communications with the rest of the world and, you know, just a lot of really cool stuff. And it was a very different posting, as you can see. I mean, just the physical building itself is incredible. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it was not, um, I'm just trying to think of, I guess like an earthquake, you know, you guys had an earthquake around here recently. It's the same thing in BC where I'm from now. I'm from Vancouver and, and we keep, we've been told for 50 years that the next big one that will tear apart the coastline is due any day now. So it's always there. You always know you could wake up in the middle of the night and your house could be collapsing on you, but it's, you can't let it consume you. And I think that's how it was here too. We were, when I was here, it was in the eighties and sort of the cold war was kind of coming to an end. It was, the end was in sight where Russia wasn't such a threat anymore. And you know, it was just sort of, maybe that was just my generation. I was, you know, it was there, but it was not a major part of my life. I wasn't, I wasn't, when was the Cuban Missile Crisis? So was that 64, 65, 69, something? I think I was alive for it, but I wasn't old enough to care, you know, so. It was just one of those things. I mean, we were trained for a nuclear attack, even in basic training. You get, you know, the gas mask training and you have to go in a gas hut, run around, you know, 10 laps around the gas hut so until you're breathing heavy and then take your mask off. And you're in a, a you know, building full of gas and you have to open your eyes and you have to speak and everything. So they'll point at you and you have to say your name, rank and your service number, or back then it was your social insurance number. So you couldn't just stand there and hold your breath because you had just been running so you're breathing heavy and they wouldn't tap you or anything. They would point at you. So you had to have your eyes open. And I mean, so we were prepared. I mean, that's just part of any war situation. I don't know about now, but. We were highly trained. Yeah. I mean, we knew we had an important job or it yeah. could be important. We were. Oh yeah. We would have done the job. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh God. Yeah. But it wasn't a day to day concern. But we were prepared, just like I'm prepared for an earthquake, and I always have been since I moved home. But it's I'm, it's like it's like I'm prepared, but it's not an everyday concern. And here, the nuclear biological component of working here was always in the back, like I said. But it wasn't our day to day concern, though. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about things like the Soviet Union and communism and that kind of thing? Was that ever in the news or did people talk about that? Well, yeah, absolutely. In fact, I brought something. I just don't want to dig it, drag around in my purse when I'm being filmed. Um, one of the th stickers that we used to have on our big safes was, um, and somebody left me one and it was just a joke because I didn't do it. We were very, 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 very aware of physical security. And I used to teach that in Kingston. So I'm coming from the bunker. <laughs> I had a ton of experience with physical security because you didn't walk anywhere and leave a door open or a drawer open. It was always, always very, everything was very buttoned up. So, but we did have something and it was, um, uh, I think it was a little sticker that somebody had made and it said, thank you comrade um, for leaving this drawer or safe or whatever unlocked or your office unlocked. Um, I have turned over whatever, I've got it in my purse. I'll show it to you when, when we're off camera. And if somebody walked in and you had forgotten to lock the safe after you took something out of it, you'd, you'd have that there. And it was like, oh, and it was such a reminder, even though you're in a fortress and within a fortress, you know, you're in this, this room that only two people are allowed to go in at any given shift. It was just such a startling shock to see that reminder that, oh my God, I left this safe open. Even though I was only outside for five minutes, somebody came in and could have taken something. So we were very, very aware of communism and, and, you know, the spies and stuff that we could be approached on the street or in a bar, you know, and somebody might know from following us that there could have been a vehicle parked out on Carp Road waiting and following us to see where we lived and then try to befriend us and all that. So that was all part of our training. Oh, yeah. Mm. Even as a, um, um, I think it was part of our telop training, our teletype operator training, even as far back as our trade training that um, you could be approached for information because even just as a regular teletype operator who didn't work in this very top secret place, you were always handling top secret codes. That was just part of the job. Here, there was different levels of top secret in this bunker and OSACS was the highest in this bunker. 
But a regular um, teletype operator like myself, who never worked in a place like this, would only have their standard top secret. So that was just part of our security training was the importance of never leaving anything lying around. Make sure you never open a crypto code one day in advance. My God, that's the inter international incident. If, if tomorrow is the 27th of August and I was going to set today's code and I open tomorrow's by accident, I would have to tell everybody. Ottawa had to know. Whoever was on the other end of that circuit had to know because nobody was allowed to use that day now. We had special keys at the end that we would use if one of them was compromised ahead of time because God knows somebody might take a photocopy of it, a picture of it, and then that whole day's traffic would be compromised. So if anybody on our end or on the other end of that circuit, whether it was Ottawa or United Kingdom, if it was accidentally opened even a little bit, it was not usable, not usable. We opened everything with a, a letter opener. We'd stick it in the corner and it was like um, a pad of paper with the gum all around it. And every day at circuit time change, we had to stick a letter opener into the, the next page, into the top corner that didn't have the gum seal, and we could only open that page. And God help you, your heart just sank if you tore that open and it's like, <gasps> that's tomorrow's! Because now the boss has to know about it, everybody has to know about it, phone calls have to be made, I, an incident report has to be, why did I expose tomorrow's key ahead of time? Did I do that on purpose? Is somebody trying to get to me and someone slipping me $100? So it was a big, big deal, big deal. So we were very, very aware, especially being Ottawa, because there's diplomat plates all over the place. And, you know, it's, you know, spies are everywhere. And we had a, um, there was a, did you ever see the movie, The Falcon and the Snowman? It probably wouldn't interest you because it's 70s. And it's about the same kind of thing, a guy that would be working in a message center environment, having access to all these crypto codes and everything, and deciding he was going to go over to Russia and sell them for money and stuff. And Timothy Hutton was the lead. And I showed that during my, um, when I was teaching my trade in Kingston, that was one of the videos that we showed. It was a movie. And there was another one in that we showed. It was just a documentary about some chief petty officer on a ship who had access to these crypto codes. And he was selling them as well until he finally got caught. So such, such a tight security on all of that kind of stuff because if the other if the enemy gets those codes especially in advance nothing is safe anymore so we were very aware very aware even though the cold war was kind of becoming over russia always tried to make themselves out to be a bigger threat than i think they were and we didn't know any better so we assumed that they were right and yeah, it was it was a pretty scary environment from that aspect. You know, we were very, 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 very high security, high secure. Yeah, on a very like uh, much less serious note, maybe, but um, the same idea of people asking you questions and that kind of thing. Did you ever get questions from maybe people in the town of Carp or from people that you know, your parents, your friends? About what you did. Sure, of course, of course, yeah. In fact, um, when my family would come out for a visit, I got permission to take them through the hallways and stuff and, you know, down into the, you know, the dining room and stuff, but they weren't allowed in any of the operational areas. But um, so they actually know the bunker. They were here when it was operational, but only into my bedroom and the public areas because not everybody that worked here was able to go into all these secure areas. Some of them were administration and, you know, just different trades that had nothing to do with the uh, the secret stuff. So my company was allowed to go where they were allowed to go for the most part. But um, yeah, I never had anybody in the town of, in the village, ask me about the bunker because I think they'd lived here long enough to know that we're not going to answer any questions. You know, mostly people would ask me things like, how can you stand being underground? How can you stand that? Oh my God, I couldn't do it. It's like working in a coffin. And it's like, it's... You know, it's like standing in your, it's, it's really not, I mean, but they didn't, they didn't get it, right? So, um, and most of the people in CARP in the village had been in the bunker at some point because we opened the doors to the public once a year. So they would, they would come in on July 1st and it was our big family day thing where everybody could come in and your husband and wife and kids could come in and see. But again, they could only walk the same hallways that we're walking now. They weren't allowed into any of the offices or any of the operational areas. 
So I was personally never approached, but we all knew the protocol. If anybody started to question you and it made you even remotely uncomfortable, you were to report it immediately, immediately. If that was a phone call to your boss on a weekend, it didn't matter. So if I was downtown in a bar or something, because I was your age, you know, and some guy started questioning me, especially if he knew stuff that I hadn't even mentioned that, you know, I'm in the military or something. If he just knew that, it's not like a man where, you know, you would have this haircut. I have this haircut because I shaved my head last year. But um, I would, you just automatically on guard. How do you know that I'm in the military? How do you know this? And it, because we were always taught to be aware, aware of somebody. And in our trades, you can't even talk about work in the car on your way home after the shift. You just don't talk about it because your car could be bugged, right? There could be a recording device in your car and you don't even know it because, you know, you're parked in an outside compound and the gate's not locked. The inside compound was locked, but the outside compound wasn't. You know, we're at the far end of the driveway there and that's where we parked and somebody could have come onto the property at the, in the dead of night. It was very dark. So it wasn't until you approached the gate where the guardhouse is in that inside compound that was locked and nobody could get to your car. So it was just always assumed that you had been tapped somehow. So we were very, very cautious. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you just mentioned quickly about your family coming out to visit. Um, what was the attitude in the bunker like in for you as well? The rule about if there was ever an emergency and not being able to bring them in. Did people talk about that? And um, we knew that because that had been on, I mean, that was common knowledge that, uh, for the married guys with their family here, that, you know, if you had to come in, your family didn't come in either, you know, but even Diefenbunker himself didn't want to come in because he knew his wife couldn't come. He, he, he was on record saying that I'm not going, at least I'm sure it was him, wasn't it? That said, I'm not going, but, um, it was one of those things that your duty, your first duty is to your country, right? So that's just a military thing. And honestly, I don't know how many people would have said, charge me, but I'm not going. I don't know. I mean, if the prime minister could say that, you know, I don't know how many of the military guys would have said, I'd rather fry out here with my, my wife and kids than be down there and come out and they're gone. You know, I don't know. Yeah. I, it was, it was common knowledge that if we ever got called in for a real war or whatever, I mean, for the BDFs, they just weren't allowed in. There's just no facilities for them. There's not enough beds for everybody. Yeah, that was just, and again, I think, I think there was a, a sense of denial that, you know, it's never going to really happen. And kind of like the big one out West with the earthquake, you know, it's possible and it's probable at some point, but not while I'm here. So I don't think anyone really stressed out over it. It was not foremost in anyone's mind, I'm sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't think at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, oh, could you talk a little, uh, when you first arrived, you said that you lived in the bunker. Yes. Um, and then you moved out at some point. Sure. Yes. When I first came into the service, they didn't have room in the bunker, or sorry, in the barracks in Ottawa, Ottawa South in Uplands. They didn't have room for us because we were only reserve. We came in under a special program where they would put us through all the regular force training but we were only guaranteed work for the first year. And after that, we had to be assessed and decide if we wanted to stay. So they, they weren't hiring us for the five year minimum, like they would for everybody else. It was one year. And if we didn't want to stay, we could leave. And if they didn't want to keep us, we could, they would say, okay, we're not renewing you. So, um, Uplands had very little vacancy back then, the big base in Uplands, the air base by the airport. So they said, these people are here for a good time, not a long time. We're not wasting rooms on them. So we had to stay down here. So I was just lucky that I was posted here with another girl because I would have been pretty intimidated being down here by myself. And then shortly after we arrived, those, I think there was five of them, those privates awaiting training guys, they got posted in shortly after we did, probably about two months. So we were old timers by then. And uh, then there was a whole group of us down here for a while. There was probably 15 of us for a short time. And then... When our years were up, they weren't all up at the same time, but they were up sort of in the same six month period. We all eventually got moved into Ottawa and we just shuttled back and forth with those big 11 passenger vans. They had a ride for us. We didn't have to bus out or anything. It was all provided. So, um, 
Um, I just have a couple more. Sure. I'm sorry I'm talking for so long. You're no, probably no, thinking, no, oh, my God. Great. I just don't want to keep you on your okay. road into town. So um, when, when you're talking to people now about your experiences at the bunker and that kind of thing, uh, what are maybe one or two, however many stories that you, sort of your go-to stories, your vivid memories of the bunker? I remember living here, especially in the first week, and it was... There was always the sound of the air conditioning. Like I mentioned, the air here is very stale and kind of stinky. It was not ever like that before. It was always cool down here, almost darn well chilly because of all the airflow. And I was much thinner back then, so I was I got colder easier. But um, it, there was always this hum of the air conditioning always. And um, in the bedrooms, when you turned off the lights, there was always bright, bright light coming from the hallway under the door. So my roommate at the time, the one that came with me from Kingston, we put a garbage bag over the square window in the door and we put a towel under the door and it was just pitch black in there. And that was just too dark. So we ended up leaving the towel only halfway across. So we had a little bit of a point of light because it was scary in there. And I remember lying there that first for probably the first 20 minutes when she had the, the towel all the way across thinking, oh my God, I mean, I can't even see my, my hand. It's like, <laughs> and your pupils are huge with the trying to take in any light you can find. It's like, <laughs> so I always thought I've got to, you know, what would it be like if all the backup systems failed on a night shift when there's hardly anybody here and the generator failed and the backup generator didn't come on and this whole place kind of went Woo, and went pitch black. So that played in my mind for years and years and years, and I finally wrote a scary novel about it. So I've got a novel written about being trapped down here in the dark. So yeah, it's very exciting to be back here and see it because I've always imagined being back here. But that was one thing. That's where my book came from, is lying in bed that first week that I lived here, trying to find a comfortable amount of light coming in under the door and realizing that it is pitch black when none of these lights are on, of course. I mean, it makes sense, but I just, it never occurred to me, you know? And it's like, what if, you know, like it got really dark, like black, and then nobody could find their way around. You'd be groping and following the walls and your eyes would be huge, you know, like, oh. So anyways, that was my novel that I wrote. So that comes up a lot. It's just where that came from. And so, um, I, oh God, there's just so many things to remember about this place. The people, of course, I would say 90% of the people for my whole six years here were fantastic. You know, there was always going to be people that you clash with a little bit, but loved all my bosses. And even our um, really mean disciplinarian, SWO position, the station warrant officer, they were always really good. You know, they were just always good. We had good commanding officers. We had good officers, fantastic sergeants and warrant officers and you know just everybody was just good I don't know it was just seemed to bring the best out in everybody and maybe it's because they you know the just the structure of the building and all the activity at the mess was designed to keep your spirits up you know which you certainly can't get a sense of that now as a museum with everything you know you can kind of see the different colors of the floor and and stuff but it was just very colorful and and very a relaxed atmosphere it was great it was really, it was a neat place to work. Really, uh, sorry, I, how many times can I say that? I'm sorry. Anyways. No, that's great. Um, food was second oh, yeah. Really good food. Really good food. Really good food. Really good. Did I mention they have good food? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Fantastic food. Yeah. Yeah, I forgot. My God. Yeah, sometimes I'll ask and sometimes I'll wait and see. And yeah. Most people. Yeah. Out. No, no, it was, it was good. One thing that when I was watching the video the other day about the Winter Carnival, I forgot how many French Canadians we had down here. I'm looking on this thing because where I live now, there's hardly any French, right? Of course, I'm in Vancouver. And I, because I work with the RCMP, though, I do, it's still a federal business. So we do have. French accents around, but nothing like what we had here. And it's like, I forgot how many Francophones we had here. So many, like, oh my God, listen, I, I'm listening on the video. It's like, does anyone have no accent? Like, oh, there's me. Okay, there's someone without an accent. It, I didn't realize how, how many Francophones we had here. It was incredible. Yeah, a lot of French. Yeah. 
which was awesome because we ended up all, you know, understanding a lot more French. <laughs> but yeah, because I grew up on the West Coast where there was not a whole lot of French. You know, we took it in school, but that's about it. Mm -hmm. You know, so, and then I moved here and it's like, wow, you pick up a lot. You know, you don't have much choice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and just one last sure. question that I've been asking everyone, but um, uh, what were your thoughts when you heard about the fall of the Berlin Wall at the end of the Cold War? history is historic for sure absolutely historic and I wondered what was going to happen now to the bunker you know if obviously the cold war is over sorry what came first the wall or the bunker the bunker closed after the bunker closed after okay yeah that makes sense yeah no I I remember wondering what was going to happen to all the people in my my trade and stuff and you know, we've already been pretty much scaled back to nothing now. We've all been reassigned to some other position now because our trade has become defunct with the desktop encryption and stuff. But um, yeah, I wondered how it would affect everything because in my whole career, I was always sort of in behind the scenes doing the secret stuff. And I just wondered, you know, how is that all going to change now? Like, who's, a, who's our enemy now, you know, because in my whole career, it was always the Russians. So, yeah, I was very sad to hear the bunker closed. And when I was posted back to Kingston, I had a medical appointment downtown Ottawa. And I decided to drive because I wanted to see the bunker. And it had already been closed. This was the mid-90s, and, and it was already down. It hadn't been sold yet. And the grounds were all overgrown. The, you know, the fences were all rusting and falling apart. And it was just was a mess. The sign was a mess. And it's like, it just tore my heart out. You know, it was such a cool place to work. I loved it. It's, I don't, and I was saying to Janet, and don't take this personally, please. I don't know what I was more excited to come and see, Janet, Joe, or the bunker. You know, it's like the bunker is it, almost like it's, it's as good a friend as they were, you know, like it's part of my life here. So it was just really exciting to come back. Very exciting. Do you get a lot of people? My turn to ask you something. Do you get a lot of ex-workers come back? Uh, yeah, yeah, they'll come through, especially in the summertime. Yeah. People will be on holiday in Ottawa. And yeah. They'll come through. It's amazing how many people still live in this area. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Joe and I both went back west, but uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, a ton of those in Geneva have been more local people, but yeah. I mean, a guy was coming through last week and he was like, oh, I have somebody from the bunker who used to work here. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad it wasn't painted and all that too. I was worried about that, that it's going to have all new paint and... Thirty years, probably was in the military, it's probably was my last six years. Me too, yeah. yeah. And, and you know, I went to Bermuda after I left here and I, if I could choose to go back to Bermuda to work more or come here, I'd come here in a heartbeat. Wouldn't even consider Bermuda. Wouldn't even consider it. Yeah. They'd have to open my office down there first. Yeah. Yeah, I'm disappointed that so many of the, the doors that I wanted to go into are locked. Yeah. Especially the message center, I would love to see in there again. What kind of gallery is that? I says some kind of gallery on the door? Uh, I'm not sure which. It's which the very, very back corner in that, on the this floor, but in the back okay. corner. Uh, it wasn't open? There's no, it's locked. And it's got a sign on it saying Deroche Gallery or something, or something like that. I'm not sure. Yeah, it's got some kind of a some kind of a display in there, but it's locked. It's too bad because we've all worked in there, so it's too bad that we couldn't see it. Mm 